So welcome to the uh, Conversational Interfaces track. Uh, we've got some amazing papers coming up and the first one uh, is going to be presented by, as you just saw, Emmy Pavainan uh, on behalf of Marie-Louise Sonagord from KTH in Stockholm. And this one actually got an um, honourable mention, so we should give a round of applause. <laughs> so if you, when you're ready. Hello and welcome to this presentation about Whispering Voice Assistance. My name is Emi Parviainen and together with Marie-Louise Jules-Santeca we present a research design project that explores how whispering influences the way people experience and also interact with voice assistants. In this paper we present how whispering opens up new dimensions of how and when voice interaction could be used. We propose that designers of whispering voice systems should reflect on how they facilitate the experiential qualities of creepiness, trust and also intimacy, and reflect on the potential challenges that whispering brings to the relation between a user and a voice assistant. So today it feels sort of like machines have overpopulated the world with sounds. At the same time, at least here in Western societies, volume has been considered as power and people have been showing importance and authority by raising their voice. However, whispering, even though it's quite weak in volume, is used to communicate various moods, feelings and contexts in human-human interaction, probably more than any other voice modality. And therefore we think that it challenges the assumption that volume really is power. So in the late 2018, Amazon introduced a new way to interact with Alexa. This is called a whisper mode. So when a user whispers to Alexa, Alexa will whisper back. And this allows a user to interact with voice assistant in contexts where speaking with full volume would not be ideal. For example, when there's a sleeping baby in the same room. And despite Amazon highlighting the useful properties of whispering, users of Alexa began to label the behavior as quite creepy. <laughs> One reason being that whispering pushes against the traditional social norms of machine-like voice systems. Something like whispering is very human-like. It's, it's, you know, it's not something that machines should know how to do. So if you have not heard how whispering Alexa sounds like, and now you wonder, let me just play a little clip. Alexa. Is it winter? It's not winter in your current location. It's autumn. Oh my gosh. Alexa, do you know the Muffin Man? I've never met him, but I do know his sister, Madame Macaroon. She's a little bit nutty, but sweet. What the f Alexa, do you want to build a snowman? Come on, let's go and play. Alexa, tell me the truth. <laughs> that seemed like a threat. Alexa, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck and a woodchuck could chuck wood? A woodchuck would chuck all the wood he could chuck. A woodchuck could chuck wood. I, this is terrifying. This is the worst thing that I've ever witnessed in my life or had to hear. If like accidentally a whisper went off in my apartment and I was alone, I would cry. I would leave, I would move. So, since there are no previous research done about whispering voice assistance, we want to explore this topic and we carried out a research design project. So here we used a um, design fiction method such as a co-speculation workshop, a design probe and also a production of a short film. And these were to inquire the future opportunities but also the challenges of using whispering as a voice modality in voice assistance. So through this design project, we came to understand a series of dimensions and experiential qualities of um, that can be analytically used to better understand this shift in social norms of voice systems and to also design new experiences of whispering voice systems. These dimensions of whispering, like we like to call them, 
mm, propose new possibilities of what and how and where to interact with their voice. And these knowledge contributions of ours are not really meant to be viewed as universal guidelines for the design of voice system, but more of a suggestion for future um, research and also speculation. So the design fiction film that we have illustrates the daily life of a protagonist, Andra, and how she uses whispering to interact with her voice system called One. One of the first scenes that we have explores how whispering could be used to maintain a calm environment at home. For example, one of our participants expressed how he would think it would be more pleasant to wake up if the system would whisper to him. You know, this kind of calm state would be more preferred than Alexa using more vocalized sound. Some um, participants also felt like it would be convenient if they could reflect on emotions, experiences through whispering. Um, the same participant also illustrated a scenario where she could be using this kind of voice system in public places, like in crowded buses or subways, um, to relieve anxiety, you know, through whispering. So it would sort of give you emotional support. And to some participants, um, the assistant would still be um, moral way to control the devices at your home, like you do nowadays. But for some, it was still kind of more like um, act as a therapist or advisor. And this is really different to how we um, think of our assistants today. So this was, we thought it was something very interesting to speculate. And also some of the participants felt like it would be very amazing if I could also get some help with making decisions in life, you know. And this is also something that we speculate in the short film. Um, what kind of questions would they be and how much would the assistant actually, how much would the user actually trust the assistant's advice? So research shows that whispering creates new experiences of interact with voice systems. And this we named the experiential qualities of whispering. So when our participants in the workshop were initially reacting to the sound of whispering, Alexa, many of them described whispering as a bit creepy. And this was because it felt like maybe it was not necessarily always the correct context to whisper. And what is right in the world context of whispering is more or less social cultural question, but the participant explained that Whispering is creepy when it's socially or contextually not necessary or a norm. Or, you know, for example, when whispering, even though no one is around or if there's no need, during nights or, for example, when whispering a laugh. And when participants were to think about whispering to the future voices, then they expressed that it would make them feel safe and calm cared for, even intimate. And it makes sense since, because it also brings a sense of closeness since in order for you to whisper to your system, you need the system to be within intimate reception by the ear. It has to be very close to you. So therefore you get this emotional but also physical closeness and intimacy with your system. Then we also have trust that we describe as sort of willingness to become vulnerable. This is something that we highlight in the short film by um, showing different kind of questions and how the trust towards the system grows as the day goes by. And the short film also raises several open-ended questions really in the experiential qualities such as like what are the limits to how human-like we want our technology to be and how close do we actually want to be with them? And can this trust that is created by increased sense of empathy from this device, can it actually be beneficial to us or are we just doomed to rely on technology even more in the future? And what does this mean to our freedom of choice and expression? 
And these questions are hardly resolved by this research, but instead address for future speculation to be explored and evaluated in research through design and other empirical studies. We want to thank the Royal Institute of Technology for all the support and encouragement and, and all the participants who took part in the workshop and the design probe experiment. I want to also thank uh, my friend Karina Furperi for acting out the short film and Nadia Kamba Wojtek for all the inspiration that she gave me. And I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, um, please write them in the chat and I'll go about calling on you to ask, uh, ask them. I've got about six minutes uh, for any questions. Yeah, otherwise I've, I have one to start off with. Mm -hmm. uh, so Emily, can you say a little bit more about kind of how you use the video as a tool in the process uh, or what it, what it did for you to make a video uh, of your findings or in other ways? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we used the um, results from the workshop and all the probe experiment to kind of um, bring this kind of video to life. We want to illustrate these kind of findings in the video. But also like while making the video, um, when we started to like um, create different like a feeling to it, think about what kind of questions would this Andrea ask the one, then it kind of, we started speculating ourselves as well. like. Um, like uh, how how far could this, for example, go? So it was kind of like uh, while we're making it, we started speculating even more, and then that kind of makes kind of speculative film. Mm -hmm. And how did it go with the design process with the with the one with the actual mm -hmm. device? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes. So it was one participant in the workshop who drew this kind of voice system that looked almost like a rock. This kind of very soft, soft rock-looking device. Uh, so we wanted to prototype that. So we made a little rope prototype of that. So I brought some fabric and then I put inside some with some flower. Oh, we just lose her. Emmy. <laughs> Emmy, Emmy seems to be, uh, I don't know. Her... Oh, she's now gone. I don't see her anymore. No, I'm here. <laughs> it's actually been great the whole day, but now it starts to. So a participant came up with this, drew this kind of stone looking device. Um, so we went to visualize some rope. So it was just made with some fabric and inside some flower and some white sand to kind of make this nightlife widgeting um, property for it. Mm -hmm. And then we gave this to uh, four participants to spend uh, over uh, five days with them mm -hmm. and kind of uh, told them like um, not be really like that you should carry around or you should use it you should use it this way but more like um, go around imagine this is your voice system that you whisper and that they could go around with that the whole week and then report back to us and also ask them like if they feel like there would be some kind of situation they would feel that it would be useful for them to whisper that they could mm -hmm. film that and and they did and then send it to us the result Walter. oh no we lost her again oh Okay, while she hopefully comes back, uh, Verpi, maybe you want to get ready to <laughs> ask your question. If she's back with the same speed as she was before, maybe. <gasps> yeah. okay. oh, no, no. Did you hear my answer? Yeah. So Verpi has a, has a question for you. Hmm? Yeah, sorry, I didn't, um, I wasn't there when you started to talk, so, um, but um, I'm interested in the experience. Um, goals uh, that we use for experience design and uh, mm. these experiential qualities that you collected were maybe not such uh, go uh, such goals for design mm. but um, if if you sh would um, instruct somebody who wants to design uh, best experiences for this kind of mm. system did you think about yeah not not specifically like that but more like um depending of course what kind of usage it would have they would have this kind of usage um it's very if you use whispering um it's most likely the experiences of intimacy and creepiness and trust will come up 
and of course mm. um, intimacy and uh, trust are more like uh, good kind of qualities that you maybe want to strive for but more like creepiness something like um, mm. you would need to want to maybe avoid uh, and then this is something like you can try to avoid for example like being able to whisper in the right context for example or being transparent uh, of the information that goes because for example if you gain trust towards assistant then it might be because the the companies want you to gain the trust so you give your data to the device you know it has very controversial uh, meaning behind it um so there's been nice to be like a fine balance and and of course it's almost impossible to you know design a device that possess trust or possess intimacy but more like um good in with good design mm-hmm. you can increase the chances of that happening exactly yeah that's always in experience design you never know yeah. what's gonna happen <laughs> really but we can try to design for a certain type of experience yeah yes. but very interesting talk thank you thank you so much we have like less than one minute left so i think we might have to move on uh, now unfortunately but thank you so much me and Marie Louisa for your paper um but, yeah uh, next we have uh, Colin Goodning from IT University of Copenhagen uh, right so I'm just gonna share yeah. my screen and presentation with you and hopefully Hi everyone, uh, my name is Karin Ryding and I'm a PhD fellow at the IT University in Copenhagen. And what I'm presenting here today is the paper, The Silent Conversation, Designing for Introspection and Social Play in Art Museums. The work was done as part of the GIFT project, so if you want to learn more about that, here's a link. Uh, but now to the background. So research in museology indicate that when we visit uh, a museum, some of the most satisfying experiences we have are either object related, as in seeing the real thing, or instructive, um, as when we learn uh, new facts. Uh, in addition, though, we have social experiences uh, where we interact with family and friends and introspective experiences when we imagine, reflect, remember or connect with things on a very personal level. A lot of previous work done uh, both in HCI and museology, however, has focused on the first two types of experiences. Um, although in the last few years there has been an increase uh, in interest in how to engage people both socially and emotionally during a museum visit. And uh, in HCI some recent uh, work uh, doing exactly this has used uh, gifting as a method. In these cases, uh, visitors have been asked to create personal experiences at the museum with someone they care for in mind. What I would like to present here, uh, however, is a quite a different approach, um, but to the approximately the same challenge. One that combines introspection with play. And what I found interesting in using a ludic approach to this uh, was that it would provide for a more open exploration of the social dynamics existing between friends and partners uh, visiting the museum together. While still, uh, as in gifting, mm, drawing on the intimate knowledge of these visitors have of uh, one another. The idea was that using play could potentially lead to insights uh, that weren't previously considered uh, in museum research. But the question was then how to combine introspection with social play as these things are uh, sometimes quite opposite of one another. So one answer to that question is uh, what I would like to present here, a two-player system called Never Let Me Go. Um, 
it uses two interconnect interconnecting web apps uh, and it enables users to spontaneously create experiences for a companion while they visit the museum uh, together and uh, I will talk more about the de design in detail in just a second. Um, the idea behind Never Let Me Go was to design a generic system which could uh, work in any large to mid-size uh, museum, art museum, gallery or sculpture park. Therefore, it was tested at three different art museums in the early stages of its development. Uh, but finally, the main trial was uh, conducted at the National Gallery of Denmark. Yeah, sorry, did it? I didn't mean to shout at you. Uh, you can't see the chat. So the the video is actually not updated. Like the we can only hear the audio and not see the the. Oh video. no! Yeah, like but I didn't know if it was just me or like I was trying to get yeah. Uh, so maybe just well now I see it changed. So maybe just try and play it now and see if that worked. Not from the beginning, I guess. No, no, no. Just from for... just from here. We don't have time, unfortunately. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um... I will just uh, continue where we were. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything? Do you yeah. see it now? We'll just try and play it. Okay. 20 participants in total using qualitative methods. Plays were observed by a researcher taking photographs and notes. Um, and after the tests, uh, they were all interviewed. In Never let me go. Uh, there are two different roles, what I call the controller and the avatar. The controller is given uh, the tools to guide the avatar through the museum. At any time, using the internet connection, um, the controllers can send prompts uh, in the form of commands, questions, or more subtle uh, instructions to the avatar who would receive them as pre-recorded voice uh, messages. And the decision to use uh, voice recordings in this way um, was inspired by work done in performance art and experimental theater. So if you're interested in that, uh, please go to the paper. Um, but here we can see some screenshots from the controller interface. And as you can see, there are six different uh, categories uh, that the controllers could choose from and they're all designed to foster introspection and play in different ways. And to the evaluation then, uh, each test was separated into four different sessions, approximately 10 minutes long. After each session ended, the participants would swap roles, uh, which meant that they would try out both the avatar and the controller role twice each. And so the results then. Overall, it can be said that participants used Never Let Me Go for two main purposes. Firstly, to give and receive personal introspective experiences in relation to the art and the architecture in the museum and secondly to explore their relationship to each other through playing teasing and pushing social boundaries as one user puts it um, because you can't interact with the artwork uh, in this way you interact with each other in the context of the artwork in most cases, the participants would not speak to each other at all during a test session. Instead, they would use body language to communicate things that they couldn't say using the system. And this was compared to having a secret language together uh, or even to use telepathic communication. Um, the experience was generally described as immersive uh, and as in being in a bubble together. These feelings were strengthened uh, by having background music, uh, but even without music, the participants felt really connected to each other all the time. All the players felt a strong obligation to follow the prompts that they received. They even felt guilty if they were not able to respond appropriately. 
However, on a few occasions, avatars would take the deliberacy to knowingly misinterpret a command, twisting the meaning somewhat, or doing what was suggested, but in a different context. One user gives this example. You came next to me and said, come closer. I knew I was sure you meant to go closer to the painting, but I thought I'm not going to go closer to the painting. I'm going to go closer to you and make you uncomfortable. That was fun. Now, one of the things uh, the participants enjoyed mostly was how the different prompts, particularly the questions, would trigger introspective experiences. There were many stories of these uh, in the interviews. Um, here is one example uh, where one user describes a situation where he, as the avatar, is standing in front of a painting depicting a view over the ocean. So, what? When I got the question, where are you? I would have expected the answer to be like, I'm right here, but that wasn't my experience. I went to where does this painting actually takes me? And it took me to a summer holiday trip where I remember I was standing at the beach looking at the waves. Knowing each other well seemed to have helped in the process of deciding which prompts to send at what time. The element of trust was also important to the players. As one user explains, I think it really makes a difference who you come with, because we trust each other so much, I think it was a deeper experience with some personal revelations and memories. Now, I don't have time to uh, go into the discussions uh, from the paper, but very briefly, uh, there is a general discussion on implications uh, for art museums uh, and secondly, a more practically oriented discussion on the advantages and disadvantages of what I call impromptu uh, experience design. But uh, now my time is up, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Orion Reading and I'm a PhD. Excellent. Thank you so much, Colin. So once again, if anyone's got any questions, leave them in the in the chat. Otherwise, I'm gonna start off uh, with a question. And I, um, there seem to be some kind of overlaps between like your approach to designing for this kind of emotional, introspective um, tool and soma design which we've heard a lot about already today and i wondered like if you could talk a little bit about that like where you see if you see any any similarities or differences yeah thank you uh yeah i was quite um happy to hear about soma design that you know i've heard about before but i wasn't so into it um and i realized that like how defamiliarization for example is used in in soma design is uh, also what I do in my work, although um, with a slight different purpose. I mean, here it's it's not so much about to um, get people to reflect per se. I mean, they do reflect a lot uh, on their um, relationship to each other while they play, but it's also something um, I use just to kind of intensify the experience to make it more, you know, emotional or, or, or interesting uh, to be in the in the museum which I mean, it's a, it's an experience uh, some of them have had many many times before just to make it different and and um, yeah more intense or or bring out new things that uh, that they didn't know about before and do you think that the body could body is a big part of your experience i mean that this my comment kind of comes out of something we've been talking about so you, you think that the body is a, a large part of the experience that you've built with um, with Never Let Me Go? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of part of the design and it's it's up to the users to, to use um, the content as they wish, mm -hmm. but obviously they are connected with these uh, two web apps and the one controlling the other partner. Um, they are physically almost connected in a sense, although it is kind of invisible connection which was quite interesting to see how people used and then as part of the content you have the, the kind of 
prompts that go to the, the body, like uh, stop, close your eyes, breathe, yeah. all these different things that they wouldn't naturally do maybe if they were in the museum. I mean, some people would, but others would never do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but here they had a, an alibi to try all kinds of different things because someone else told them to, to do it. So that's also interesting, right? This kind of what makes us, uh, you know, able to do something. And, uh, and obviously I use play as that alibi in, in a sense uh, in this side. Well, I can't pretend to be neutral because I was, uh, I did play test <laughs> in the early stages. And it was, it was fantastic. I mean, it was, it was really, it gave a completely different experience of the museum. It was, yeah, I think it's a really beautiful piece of design. Does anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, I have, a, I have another one. So, Marie-Louise, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you for the presentation. So I, I was curious about these voice recordings. Um, if you could tell a little bit more about some of the considerations you had in in choosing voice and like what kind of voice, because uh, that, I guess there's also some sort of like embodied element to voice in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm using my, my own voice uh, simply because that was like the cheapest and easiest <laughs> option I had when doing the prototype. Uh, but in my con considerations of like how I would do that voice myself then, um, was that first of all, I wanted to be a, a rather neutral voice, not loaded with too much um, feelings and so on, uh, because I wanted the experience to be quite open or, or for the participants to use it in a in a quite an open manner. So I, I didn't want to control it um, too much. At the same time, I wanted them to feel calm. So it, it's quite a calm voice, you know, rather neutral, quite slow um, to get them into that mood of kind of relaxing and, and experiencing in a, in a different way. Um, and then I also sometimes use background music and sometimes not to kind of just test out the difference. Um, yeah. Can you say a little bit more about um, about the kind of relationship between art museums or museums in general and and this kind of work? And like maybe for those people who don't have that much background uh, in the kind of museum intervention space, seeing as this is a conversational <laughs> interfaces track, uh, could you say something more about like how did those art museums feel about this kind of work? And how did you experience during your testing? Did you get any kind mm. of did the security guards come and follow you? <laughs> how, how did that, how that work? <laughs> well, I, I had a discussion with the security guards beforehand, so they were well aware of what was going on. Uh, but it's quite interesting with the museum world because they are, I mean, I presented this to uh, museum people as well, and they were really interested in it because they, they need tools to make people more engaged. Um, because they have a problem with that sometimes, so bringing in new um, audiences and so on. Uh, at the same time, the play element is a bit scary uh, for them. Um, and I find this uh, very interesting because of this, of, you know, from the result, I can see that it, it's really something that people who are doing it appreciate really much and they can use it in so many different ways. At the same time, uh, obviously you do lose a certain amount of control over your visitors to the museum if they don't follow the you know the curated track so to say instead they go off on their own adventures and um, and I mean I did push this a little bit for example as part of never never let me go I had a touch command <laughs> and just to provoke a little bit I mean I was obviously there to make sure nothing went wrong but but yeah, I just wanted to see how they use it. And that was like super popular uh, among the participants. They used it very much, um, not to touch something they couldn't touch because they knew exactly what to do and not to do, but, but just to kind of, you know, begin to reflect on what was possible in that space. Uh, and obviously, if I spoke to a curator about that, they would be much more afraid, I think, about that um, experimentation. Uh, uh, in a sense. At the same time, in an art museum, you know, uh, art has that uh, role as well to, to kind of push our boundaries and experiment. Uh, so I, I think it's very fitting for that um, situation. But uh, yeah, that's what I can say. In terms of the curation question of the fact that they've created a certain experience to be yeah. experienced a certain way, 
like do, could you kind of open up can you imagine opening up the project to design uh, the experience with with the museum themselves is that a conversation that you've been happening it's yeah it was interesting because uh, i was contacted by, by some uh, art museums um after a presentation i had a you know conference with uh, museum people and they w were interested in but they wanted to kind of pick specific or like um change some of the prompts maybe to add uh, questions that were maybe more relevant yeah. to them or so on I, I i haven't been able to go into a, a deeper conversation with them so i don't know exactly how they would tweak it but but obviously uh, that would be an interesting kind of exploration to see you know but at the same time so i wanted it to kind of be general because to see if that was possible and and it turned out to be possible because uh, the participants make meaning out of it so much themselves but through the context so the context matters yeah uh, but you don't have to have the context present in the content as i see it but right. but yeah obviously you can do that too i just haven't tried it <laughs> are there any more questions last minute oh then we'll say thank you so much karen fantastic presentation thank you Okay, so I'm happy to show you my pre-recording. Great, so this is uh, Rainer Winkler uh, presenting his paper on behalf of his co-authors. So thank you and uh, off you go. Uh, let me quickly double check. Do you hear and see? Yeah. Good afternoon, video. everybody. Thanks for inviting us. My name is Rainer. Yeah, okay, great. Winkler from the University of St. Gallen, Switzerland, and my co-authors are Sebastian Hober from University of Göttingen, Germany, Antti Salovada from the University of Elzo, Finland, Matthias Söllner from the University of Kassel, Germany, and Jan Marco Leimaster from the University of St. Gallen, Switzerland. You can simply follow the link at the bottom or use our QR code to access the paper. So what is the paper about in a nutshell? In our paper, we created a multi-channel scaffolding-based conversational agent that is integrated in an existing online video lecture. We compared our conversational agent named Sarah with other often implemented conversational agents and found out that our conversational agent significantly improved learning outcomes in a post-test programming task compared to more traditional conversational agents and also compared to the video only. These findings highlight the need to include multi-channel and scaffolding-based conversational agents in online education to generate more meaningful interactions. How do I want to structure the presentation? So first, I will motivate the topic, then explain something about already existing conversational agent studies in online education. We'll elaborate on our main research question, the design principles of SARA, how we evaluate it, the main results and learnings, and last but not least, the limitations and the future outlook. What we see now in these difficult times is also a trend of the last few years. More and more students enroll in online courses. In these new learning scenarios, student-teacher ratio is usually very high. This is why educators mainly use online videos to transfer their content to the students. Unfortunately, this format does not allow individual interaction between a student and the teacher. And we know from learning theory that individual interaction between a student and a teacher is crucial for learning success. This is why conversational agents gained interest in this field. They might be able to partially solve this problem. Recent studies implement the conversational agents in online learning environments, for example, in a forum, as a reflection tool, and so on. Until now, to the best of our knowledge, uh, conversational agents were never implemented on top of existing video lectures, and we want to investigate if these kinds of conversational agents are promising. I've already spoken about existing conversational agents in education. Nowadays, we have a huge variety of conversational agents in education. We have text-based conversational agents where they show questions and learners click on buttons. Some systems use embodied conversational agents that are capable of displaying emotions and gestures. Some have voice output and some have also voice input. The most prominent conversational agent in the field might be Autotutor from Gresser et al., which has proven to be very successful. Then we have QuizBot used to learn factual knowledge, which was a paper from last year's Sky. 
Then we also have reflection bot that helps students to reflect about their learning during an online course. And there are more and more studies that use commercially available conversational agents such as Amazon's Alexa or Apple Siri. Based on the existing work in the field and our identified research gap, we asked the question whether multi-channel and scaffolding-based conversational agents layered on top of existing online lectures are able to increase learning success within these lectures. We built Sarah based on three design principles that we derived from scaffolding and cognitive theory of multimedia learning. First of all, we divided between a main and sub dialogue. Every time the students didn't know an answer or provided the wrong answer, Sarah changed to the sub dialogue and continued with a scaffolding dialogue that should bring students back on track. To get this implemented, we used a publicly available NLP framework called NLP Chairs, which showed to be a leading framework according to recent benchmarks. Finally, Sarah used multiple channels to interact with the students. She used voice for her responses and the things she said were then printed on the screen and the students were able to use their voice to communicate with Sarah. To evaluate Sarah, we used the pre- and post-test experiment design. In our laboratory, we showed every student two videos where they were able to interact with one of four different types of conversational agents and we also added a control group where learners watched the video only. The conversational agent interrupted the video four times per video. Here you can see an example of a five minute video clip where the conversational agent interrupted the video four times. Altogether we had four different types of conversational agents. One was a non-scaffolding text-based conversational agent. The other one was a scaffolding text-based. Then we had non-scaffolding text and audio based and Sarah. And to really show how this worked, we uh, prepared a little demonstration. So print 123, prints out 123, print 98.6, prints it out. So these are just really the syntax of constants. And without constants, we can't write really much. How would you describe a constant? A constant is a fixed value. Yes, that's right. Constants are fixed values such as numbers, letters, and strings. What different types of constants exist? Strings and numbers. That's right. We differentiate between string and numeric constants. What is the difference between these two types in Python? I don't know. No problem. Let me help you. String constants are texts whereas numeric constants are numbers. String constants are texts whereas numeric constants are numbers. Please say next to continue. Next. What you just saw in the, in the demo was our conversational agent Sarah layered on top of an existing video and also showed the other conversational agents in the study. I will now go to the main results and learnings. When comparing the post-test scores of the students, we were able to support the hypothesis that learners interacting with a scaffolding-based conversational agent show higher levels of information retention and transferability. We were not able to support the hypothesis that voice and text-based conversational agents are superior to textual conversational agents only. But interestingly, we saw an interaction effect between the channel and the scaffolding effect for information retention and transferability. You can see here our descriptive results for information retention and transferability. So for example, students interacting with Sarah scored 77.8 out of 100 points and 65.4 out of 100 for transferability. 
we conducted the NANCOVA with pretest results as covariates and here you see the mean differences in the scaffolding manipulation for information retention as well as for transferability. For example, the difference between scaffolding and the control group is nearly 20 points in the post-test. 50% of the post-test results are within the error bars you see here. Every time the error bars are not crossing the zero point, the difference is significant. And here you see the results for the voice manipulation. Our findings confirm the scaffolding effect of past research also in this video lecture setting. We argue that future CAs designs in online education should use speech recognition mechanisms. And finally, we showed that publicly available NLP frameworks are already powerful enough to offer sufficient support for students. Our presentation is of course not without limitations. So first of all, our algorithms not always detected the right and wrong answer of students. Nevertheless, we calculated an intervention selection accuracy score of 95%, which was quite satisfying. It would be interesting for future research to use similar frameworks as we did. Second, we had a laboratory setting which of course is a bit artificial. And there also might be kind of a technology effect when students first use this uh, conversational agent. It would be interesting to implement the conversational agents in real online courses. And finally, we evaluated the conversational agent in a rather narrow context within a programming online course. So other domains might have other characteristics and affordances. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to discuss our findings with you. So thank you so much. Um, give a round of applause to Rainer. Very good job. Thank you. So there's no questions come up yet, but uh, please everybody else uh, think and leave one for Rainer. Um, and I can start with a question. This is not my area of expertise. Um, so perhaps this is a, a slightly ridiculous question, but I was just w wondering if you have had some kind of experience with thinking about how would you get educators to kind of uh, input into Sarah, like how would you how would you onboard educators in training Sarah, because I guess that that would be a very specific task. Yeah, I think um, that would be the next step um, of this research. So first we wanted to find out if, if there's really an effect. So if they can can have better learning outcomes uh, with this conversational agents. And I think this is a very crucial point to, to um, bridge the gap between uh, the pedagogical knowledge of the educators and also the technical knowledge. Um, yeah, I think we have to make it from a technical side, we have to make it very easy. So you can, for example, embed just some code and then it would, would work um, for the video. But of course, it's also very important to have a didactical design. So um, to see, okay, where does it make sense? How many interactions make sense? Something like that. And I think this is subject to future research then. Yeah. I was also thinking that your uh, scaffolding, th the scaffolding theory, yeah, that's a very specific type of kind of pedagogical theory and perhaps not all teachers would align with it so perhaps you'd you'd have to first have some kind of onboarding in that way as well i was thinking wouldn't would you agree that's true that's true yeah um i think we can also use this conversational agents not with uh, with a scaffolding approach but maybe also just for simple simply ask a question to to repeat the content uh, the instructions but um, yeah, for us, it definitely makes sense to have this scaffolding approach, but of course, not every educator would, would mm -hmm. um, say, yeah, I will, I will use it. And then we've got a question from Ahmet, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, I, I just typed it, but uh, I, I was I was just wondering, uh, how do you think different types of voice interaction, or do you think that actually uh, different types of uh, voice interaction like um, we saw in the in one of the previous papers whispering for example uh, could contribute to learning through uh, conversation agents especially when you consider long-term and in the wild interaction or learning process mm -hmm. um, very interesting question uh, I asked the same question myself so um, for us it 
was not very important because we had this short-term laboratory setting. So um, our voice was very synthetic and we really expect that some, expected that some feedbacks would be, okay, this is not, this is very synthetic. Um, you can't compare it with a real human, something like that. But there was nearly no feedback about that. So it might not matter in the short run. But I think um, if you would use it for an online course, it would matter because then it's more about building up a relationship with the tutor. And there, I would say it makes sense to, to have different types of, of voice. Yeah, and also um, trust building uh, voice styles. So uh, we don't have any more questions, but I have, I have another question. Um, I hope other people are thinking of them. So you mentioned in your paper that the, obviously the, there are limitations with Sarah um, and kind of an obvious limitation in some ways is thinking of different types of education because your example with Python is a very kind of binary. There is a right answer, there is a yeah, wrong answer. Um, can you say a little bit more about kind of perhaps uh, things you've been thinking about in terms of scaling your tool to other subjects? Or what, what, are, the, what are these limitations? Mm -hmm. So um, most of the conversational agents in education were used in very structured domains. So maybe math or, or also programming where you can really anticipate the, the answers of the student. This might be more difficult in other domains. Um, so. But I think with recent technical developments, we can also um, try to jump in these domains and also use conversational agents there. But um, I think nowadays limitations are, are here and we are a bit bound to this very structured, uh, structured answers where we can really anticipate. So this might also be um, from a pedagogical side, this might be a limitation because sometimes you just wanna ask um, questions where you need a, a a few sentences to answer that question, and this might be hard. Yeah. So I was even thinking about kind of design education. Like, okay, could could it work for <laughs> could it work for a design education? This kind of tool where we've got so many different definitions for even the terms that we use that things would get quite complicated very quickly. That's true. Yeah. So I'm gonna. If we don't have any more questions. Then I suppose we can have an early. Oh, I could <laughs> really <Rene Weaver. laughs> <laughs> Um <laughs> Very good question. So I uh, read a paper, um, a paper where they had a look at uh, at names of conversational agents, and there they said uh, a very short uh, female name would be. Uh, would be a very good choice, but of course, there's a lot of uh, bias in there. Um, I think it's just, I always called them Sarah and I, I just just like the name. Maybe that's the, the best reason. Really, Louisa, can I ask you uh, why you asked that question or could you say a little bit more? <laughs> <laughs> I know your research is uh, <laughs> particularly uh, positioned as a critique to uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was no, I was asking the question uh, because uh, yeah, I done I done some research into gendered aspects of voice assistants and how a lot of voice assistants are uh, are gendered in a like normative female way, like having uh, uh, women's names and often using women's uh, voices, and that it sort of builds on a history of how how women's voices has been used as assistants throughout history um, so I was just I, so often whenever there is like an assistant that has a uh, woman's names I just like asking this question because often the developers has not considered it so much or have considered to challenge it so uh, <laughs> yeah and I'm here I'm also thinking about this this is a, supposed to be a teacher right so are you building on some sort of stereotypes of who the teacher is uh, and so on Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that might be another limitation or another point that should be discussed in the paper. Yeah, that's, that's true. But the voice, uh, the voice of Sarah is actually a male voice as in the one that you, in the demo that you played or? <laughs> Maybe it's, uh, <laughs> 
Um, it should be a female uh, voice, but it's very synthetic. Um, okay. Yeah, that would be also the option to have a, a male voice. Yeah, yeah. This might have lead to different results. I don't think so, but could be. Hmm. Maybe it really. I mean, it really depends on the context, on the content itself. You try to to transfer. Hmm. Lovely. Okay, but thank you so much, Rainer. Um, thank you. If nobody's, yeah, and we've got three, a few minutes left, so I, but I don't see any more questions. Uh, so then I think we can have an earlier break. And then the next session is at 4.15, I think. So thank you very much to all of our speakers and for everyone attending. <laughs>